So I will try to be very precise and brief, okay? So uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to share my experience with uh, One Pieces Plants. I have about seven or eight years of experience with One Pieces Plants. And I would like to give you my perspective on how these implants have helped develop my implant practice and given me and my patients a lot of happiness and satisfaction over the last seven to eight years. So when you look at success in implantology, what I feel is that for every patient, success means something different. We have to look at our patient's expectations. Do all our patients want to have multiple bone graft surgeries, soft tissue surgeries, just to receive some pink aesthetic? Or are they looking at function? Are they looking at a quick procedure, painless, so that they are able to eat food on a daily basis? Then, we also have to look at the patient's medical history. Is the patient's medical history allowing us to fulfill our treatment objectives? We look at the intraoral picture of the patient. What is the opposing arch? Does he have a denture in the opposing arch? Is he a brasser? Does he have attrition, bare facets? And by understanding this picture of the patient, only then can we decide what our prosthetic plan should be. And yes, we should first decide the prosthetic plan when we talk about dental implants. And only then should we consider what surgical options are needed to fulfill that prosthetic plan. So I have found that single piece implants help me in many cases in which I would not have solutions with conventional implants. A few of the advantages that the single piece implants provide me is that it is minimally invasive. A lot of my patients are above the age of 45, 50, 55 years of age, and they are not looking at getting into invasive, time-bound uh, surgeries, which will last uh, over a year with multiple procedures. They want a quick and simple solution so that they can enjoy their meal. That's it. The appointments are, of course, much fewer in number, and also they are a lot quicker. That helps me and the patient both. And together with this, we have a lot of patient comfort. So I'm able to provide the patient a reliable option of treatment in a quick way, in a comfortable way, and most importantly, what I have experienced over the last six to seven years in a very reliable way. Okay? And the main thing that I like about single piece implants is that it utilizes the existing bone of the patient. There are different designs of single piece implants available and each of these designs have their own bone indication. So you have the compressive implant which is for regular cases, you have the basal implants which are for extremely tough and resolved cases like the cases we saw earlier today and of course you have the hybrid implant which is both basal and compressive mixed which you can use for moderate cases. So what happens with single piece implants is that I can choose an implant that is designed for the type of bone that my patient has come with. And of course, it helps a lot in terms of cost of procedure. My treatment acceptance is a lot higher because it's cost effective for me and the patient both. So as you would say in today's words, hashtag keep it simple. What is very, very important to know is that when using these implants, you have to follow the proper technique. There are three but very simple rules, but very essential rules, just like you can say the tripod stand for the camera. Even if you don't follow one of them, your case will not be a success. If you follow these three simple rules, I can tell you that you sure will also have the same predictability and success as I am seeing in my practice. The most important thing to understand is bone. Whichever implants we are choosing to put, we are placing these implants inside the patient's bone. And our understanding of the types of bone, that is cancellous and cortical, the quantity and the quality, understanding where we can find good quality of bone is very, very important, more than quantity. 
We don't look at how wide the ridge is, but we look at where we can find the particles in that particular bone, the, which is you know easily visible as the very white and dense areas. As long as you are able to engage your implant into these particles of the bone, you will find a great degree of success. Because if you see the graph on the top right corner, the particle bone is about four to five times as strong as your cancerous bone. So that means if you are putting an eight millimeter implant in your cancerous bone, a two millimeter implant in the cortical bone can provide you almost the same amount of anchorage. Now imagine putting an implant in eight millimeters of cancerous bone and extending it, taking a longer implant, which also engages the cortical bone at the end. So you have both the benefits, eight millimeters of cancerous plus two millimeters of cortical, which again equals to eight millimeters. So you get a lot of primary stability, and this is one of the main reasons why you can immediately load these cases, even which have very low bone volume, but very good bone quality. If you see this case, for example, this is the cortical bone. You can see how thick and dense this bone is as compared to the cancerous bone in the center, which is you know, not dense at all. You can imagine the anchorage the implant will receive from this bone as compared to what you will achieve from a cancerous bone. So when doing immediate loading, you must make sure you take a CT scan and you identify the particles on the palatal side, on the floor of the nose, floor of the sinus, on the border of the mandible, and you try to place your implants to engage these corticals to get maximum stability. The other very important part that we have to pay attention to is the physiology of the bone. How is the bone going to react once I put my implant in this bone? And on the bottom right side, you have this graph that shows you that the day you put your implant, after six to seven days, the bone quality actually goes down. It actually decreases. And this continues to happen until at least three to four months where the bone quality has finally improved again. So for the first one or two months, the bone quality goes down and it takes another two months for the bone quality to come back up and for the integration or the osteointegration to take place. And thus, it is, once you understand this aspect, you understand that we have to somehow stabilize or split our immediate lower implants so that we can prevent this effect of the decrease in bone quality. And the best way to do this is to split one implant to another. So that is why full arch cases, immediate loaded, are actually one of the easiest cases to do because you have 6, 8, 10, even 12 implants cross arch to split, uh, to split your implants with. This provides a very high degree of success. And of course, as I mentioned before, you must understand bone anatomy. So, first important rule for using single piece implants and immediate loading. Place the implants long enough so they may engage the cortical bone and splint them rigidly, rigidly being the key word with using metal, that is intraoral welding, or a cementable metal frame, or a screwed metal frame for at least four months. Just like we need to splint uh, our hands when we have a fracture. If there is any movement, the fracture will not keep. Similarly, if there is any movement of the implants, osteointegration will not take place. But if you are splinting the implants well, I can assure you no matter which type of implant you use, by four to six months, all immobile implants will integrate with the bone, no matter whether they are surface treated or whether they are smooth surface. The second very important thing that we must consider while doing single piece implants is understanding the implants itself. Now we know the bone, we know how there is a soft bone and there is a hard bone present everywhere. Now we must understand what type of implant do we use in this bone, what type of implant do we use here, and what type of implant do we use here. Because we are lucky to have a system that offers us different, absolutely different types of implants. Just like antibiotics. You don't use the same antibiotic to treat all infections, right? You have a different antibiotic for gram-negative, Infections, you have a different antibody for gram positive infection. Similarly, with this system, we have the opportunity to choose the right implant for each type of bone. So let's go through that. When the bone is a 
about four to five millimeters in width, you have the option of using either delayed load or immediate load. We have a narrow diameter implant in the root form, even up to three millimeters, which will allow you to place the implant in about four millimeters of bone as well. When we look at immediate load, and we look at wide bridge cases where the width of the ridge is exceeding four millimeters, we can use the compressive implant with very high predictability in such a way that it will engage all the cancerous bone as well as the tip of the implant must engage the cortical as well. The compressive implant is called compressive because it condenses the bone that it goes into it. So you are increasing the density of the bone that it is engaging and hence you can predictably do immediate loading on it. To place a compressive implant, you just need to use a single drill, which is basically like a pinhole drill, which just provides a path of insertion. And the implant itself navigates through the soft bone, makes it dense, and creates a very high amount of primary stability. And you double ensure yourself by making sure you engage the cortical bone. Now, what happens in this bone? When the bone is so narrow, like a few other cases we saw before, we have to opt for a different system. This narrow bone primarily consists of dense cortical bone. And dense cortical bone is already 99% calcified. You cannot increase the density anymore. And hence, if you try to place a compressive type of implant in this bone, you will have what we call as compressive necrosis. So the only option to go for in this case is to use what we call as the basal implant. And the basal implant is an implant that just acts like an anchor, like a hook. It is a non-compressive design, it has a narrow shaft, it's a polished shaft, and it has very sharp threads which go and mechanically engage into this extremely dense cortical bone that we have. And this mechanical engagement provides you with a very high insertion of 80-90 newtons at least. Also the other benefit is that the neck of the implant is long and polished. It means what? It means that even if there is some amount of remodeling at the crest of this very, very narrow ridge and you have a little bit of recession, you will never have peri-implantitis, you will never have inflammation of the gum because this implant uh, resists bacterial infection no matter the amount of recession. Unlike a rough surface implant like this or the compressive where we have bone loss up to the first thread, the rough surface will attract the bacteria and you will have peri-implantitis. So this is quickly just to show you a few examples of in which conditions you will use which type of implant. Anytime you have a wide ridge, more than 4 millimeters at the crest, you can definitely use a compressive implant. And anytime you have a very narrow ridge, which is less than 3 to 4 millimeters at the crest, you can very safely use a basal implant with the same predictability. The main thing for a basal implant is that the apex of the implant and one side of the implant must be anchored in cortical bone. If you take this basal implant and place it in this very wide ridge with a lot of cancerous bone, this implant will fail. And that is one of the main reasons why there are so many mixed opinions about basal implants because the proper indication and the proper technique is not followed. So the last thing that also makes a big difference to a long-term success of, I would say, any implant restoration is the prosthetic protocol. And most importantly, the occlusion. If you want to have predictable long-term success, 5, 10, 15 years, no matter which system you use, whether it's screw retaining, conventional implants, compressors, basal implants, your occlusion scheme design plays a very key role in directing the forces that are received by this. So you have a good bone, you have placed a good implant, but does that mean that it can withstand any occlusion force? Absolutely not. If you see your cases where there is chestal bone loss, where there is screw loosening, where there is ceramic chipping, all of this is because of unbalanced occlusion forces. And if gone unchecked, will eventually lead in long-term implant failure. So to design a proper occlusion scheme is the most, I would say the most important part if you're looking at long-term success. When we talk about prosthetics and we talk about aesthetics, the single most factor that I would like to highlight for you right now is the vertical dimension. 
you can achieve aesthetics and good function with any implant system irrespective of the connection or the design as long as you have restored the patient back to their original vertical dimension and you have sufficient vertical space to design a beautiful prosthesis. So before we make any case, as I mentioned, the first objective has to be to do a good prosthetic plan. And the first step in deciding what prosthesis my patient will receive is to check the vertical dimension. If he has a highly compromised vertical dimension, you have to look at treating the opposing arch. You may have to look at testotomy to reduce the supraerupted bone. Or if the patient has an excess of vertical dimension, you may have to look at giving metal acrylics as a, a you know, or a hybrid prosthesis as a permanent restoration because the metal ceramic will not be able to uh, justify the lip support or even the weight of the prosthesis will be too heavy. So that is the first step that you consider before treating any patient with what is the available vertical dimension and hence what the type of prosthesis I will be giving the patient. The single piece implant system also has all of the prosthetic options that you can expect to receive a good prosthesis from the lab. You have to follow some very simple and very like quick steps. The first one being you must do a wax up before attempting any surgical case. You have to know where your teeth are and only based on the position of your teeth can you decide at which position the implants must be placed. Okay, this automatically gives you a big step ahead in giving good aesthetics. Once the implants are placed, you should use the transfer caps. There are transfer caps provided and using the transfer caps definitely helps give more accurate impressions, much better margins and of course very good emergence profiles. Okay, so if you are concerned about emergence profiles and aesthetics from single piece implants, if you use the transfer caps and if you use the analogs and you follow the proper lab reduction protocol, you will get very good aesthetics. They also have multiple options on the abutments. There are angle abutments which can be cemented out to correct the angles. If bending the implant is not something that you want to do, there are geometric fixations that allow a retrieval of prosthesis. So you have really all the options available to you, okay? I would like to share quickly a few cases so that you can see the application of this system. This is a, a, a patient how he presented. You can see the first thing here is that he has a completely collapsed vertical dimension. So what this means, that I first must check if there is enough space for me to put implants and give him two fixed prosthesis, one upper, one lower. We need to achieve at least 10 to 14 millimeters of clearance between both ridges. Do I need to do alveoplasty, or is it just that he has collapsed vertical because of long-term wear? So anyway, we go ahead with the case. We evaluate the 2D, the OPG, and we also evaluate the 3D. The CBCT or the 3D is a very very important diagnostic tool when it comes to doing imaging loading. Uh, to give you an example. If you look at the OPG, it's like operating with only one eye. Imagine drilling and placing an implant with one eye closed. That's difficult, right? That's exactly what it is planning an implant case with an OPG. The minute you look at a CBCT or you see a 3D picture of the patient, you can see a whole lot more. You can see where the particles are. You can see the distance between the crest and the particle. And you can make sure that you can place your implants very safely without invading any vital structures and at the same time engaging the cortical bone. You can also decide if you want to place your implant palatally. If you see in this section, the length of this implant is only going to be 6 or 8 millimeters. But if I just go a little behind and I choose to place my implant in the palatal direction, the same side can be restored by an implant that is about 12 to 14 millimeters. And that is the advantage of CBCT. A case that you thought was difficult suddenly becomes very easy because on the CBCT you see that there is bone behind the sinus and this is there many many times. So please evaluate a 3D CBCT before planning your implants. It helps you choose the correct length as we have the soft tissue thickness visible we can always see that the tip of the implant is going to be engaging. We can see the direction of the implant has to go in and choose the correct diameter right before surgery and that greatly reduces your inventory as well. So you make a 3D plan you assess it prosthetically and then you proceed for surgery. You can do freehand or you can use a guide. 
I've been doing this surgery for the last eight years, so I prefer to do freehand surgery, as I think it gives me better control. So you place all the upper and lower implants, you take the impressions using the prosthetic protocol, you take your wax pipe, you mark the midline, you mark the height, you usually give the lab the proper information. The lab will then send you the correction jig, just as the lab would adjust the, the abutments of your two-piece implants, same way the lab can adjust the abutments of the one-piece implants. It makes your job very easy. All you do is put the implants and send the impression. The lab does all the prosthetic work for planning and he sends you a jig. You can just cut the implants as per the jig, do the metal trial, and go ahead with the case. Okay? Just Another very important aspect is when the lab sends you the final metal ceramic bridge, you must make sure the entire bridge is wrapped in ceramic. You must make sure even the tissue surface is wrapped in ceramic. This helps a lot when it comes to controlling hygiene of the patient and uh, modifying any recession spaces that may come up later. I'm sorry I cannot give you the exact details because of the shortage of time, but I would just like to point out to you the options. Also, adjusting the occlusion is extremely important. If I can quickly point out to you, what is very important is that the anterior teeth must not have any contact. As you can see here, they're free of contact, and the contact in the posterior teeth must only be on the palatal cusps. Must only be on the palatal cusps. You must not have any occlusion contact on the buccal cusp at all. Okay? Contact on the buccal cusp causes lateral movement which is the number one cause of implant failure uh, in early degree. So you adjust the occlusion, and that is the finished case in 2D. And I also like to take a CVCV even post-operative to make sure that all the implants are healing fine six months later to make sure that the osteomization has taken place and we have good bone adaptation on the implants. So quickly going to a more complex case, here CVCV makes all the difference. If only I had a 2D OBG of this patient, I would not be able to treat this patient at all. I would send them away. But with the CBCT, I can check very clearly where the nerve is, where the bone is available, and plan the case properly so that I can check the width, the length of the basal implant. Obviously, a case like this, for me, the preference would be is to treat the patient with basal implants. So first, I like to plan the case on 2D, using the implant, so I have a basic idea as to how many supports I need for my thesis, how many implants I need to support this, and what should be the approximate location. There are a few areas that we, we avoid. We avoid the area near the sinus. Of course, the plates now provide us a very good opportunity to put the plates in the region of the sinus to utilize the cortical buttresses. But if you are not working with plates, then typically a carotid is an absolute must an absolute must. I have been doing carotids for about six years now, and they are extremely reliable. They're a bit tricky to place. Even after six years of experience, every carotid is uh, still presenting as a challenge. But uh, you get more used to it and utilize the predictability of this implant. And then, of course, we place at least four to six implants in the anterior region. All of them engaging the floor of the nose and the floor of the sinus. In the posterior and in the mandible, we place at least four implants in the fashion of the all on four. And the reason we do this is to distalize this abutment. If I place this implant straight, my abutment will be in the region of three or even four. But by angling this implant and then bending it, I get an implant, uh, an abutment right in the region of five, which helps me a lot with distal cantilevers. So you plan the case in 3D, you check the position of the nerve, and you can see here that the nerve is buckly placed towards the region of the seven. So you can very easily place an implant to bypass the nerve using the CBCD and then use a surgical guide with a pilot drill guide to help you place that implant in very dense cortical bone and make it very, very reliable. That way you can avoid distal cantilevers as well. So this is the plan. It, there will be no implant possible in this if I put the implant straight, but if I go a little on the lingual side using a guide, I can easily bypass this implant and we'll put an 8 millimeter implant in very dense, very, very dense part of the bone, which makes it very reliable. So this is the 
uh, anorganic force operative. And in such cases, I take an immediate force operative CBCT as well to check that my placement of my implant has gone exactly as I had planned and we have been able to miss, uh, yeah, and we have been able to miss the nerve and engage the implant exactly as we have planned. And this gives us uh, a good opportunity to give the patient teeth up to the second molar even if, if the patient demands. So this is the finished case. And this is uh, the follow-up. Again, with the scan, you can see good bone growing around the implant that has been placed to bypass the nerve over here. The patient has full sensation, did not suffer a single layer of paresthesia, a single minute of paresthesia, and was absolutely fine. And I have done many such cases in the past, but do not have meticulous planning and this is the like a photograph of the finished case. You must have meticulous planning and you must use uh, a 3D guide for the drill. Um, another case where basal implants make a big impact, we open the flap, there is no bone at all. You can see the roots of the teeth. What are the options in these cases? How many sections of bone grafting must we do to help this patient? So in this case again, we use basal implants to engage the floor of the nose. And this case was done in 2014. The graft was also done. The graft was done in this case to support the soft tissue. Because we don't want the soft tissue to lose, we want to have good settings. So you still can put a graft, you put a membrane, you do whatever you need to get a good soft tissue, and the patient walks out with teeth the same day after surgery. Okay? And this is also possible because of the intraoral welding that you can see here that has been done to stabilize these extremely long implants, to split them together like a tripod so there is no movement at all. So this is the photograph of the patient with the ceramic prosthesis in 2017. That's about uh, three years post-op and today 2020 and I was lucky the patient came in just before I came here. So this is six years post-op on a basal implant segment case done in the anteriors, the CBCT. And you can see the implant nicely placed and bone uh, on both sides of both the implants. And this is the second implant. This is another case, I'll show you quickly with the same thing with the post-op CBCT follow-up. This is a bridge of the case, like the case we saw earlier today. Extremely narrow bridge. And uh, the way I treated this case was I did uh, basal implants. And you can see that when the implant goes in, it does like an internal wrist thread. We can see the palatal and the buccal portico have separated, and these implants are now engaged in the floor of the nose. And it has a good cortical support on the buccal, on the palatal, and on the cortex. So these implants are extremely firmly anchored. Also, what we do here is do an intraoral welding to stabilize these implants on the buttons so there is no movement at all. The tip of the implant is fixed into the cortical bone, which will not move. The abutment of the implant is welded with each other, so they cannot be any movement. So there is no option but for these implants to integrate. And when the patient came for a follow-up, I took a short video uh, to try and show you. Uh,
of this is the same way we did look at to get maximum anchorage and the patient has now come back uh, six months later after one year so I came back after one year in this case and we removed the provincial this is the remove the bar it's very very easy to remove this bar it takes maybe just 10 minutes to cut it off You can see the healing of the soft tissue. So, yeah, I just want you to hear that sound so you can understand that these implants really have integrated. So, uh, I know now I am between you and lunch. So, uh, it's lunch time. And I have not finished my presentation, unfortunately, but we will have to stop it here. Or should I take five minutes more? Can I continue? Okay, thank you. So, this is another case that I want to show you very quickly. I'll just take five minutes. And I want to show you a case from beginning to end with just all the steps and photographs, okay? So, I'll be talking less. I'll just be showing you all the pictures. Implants placed. Impression taken, model cord, and just like uh, the doctor showed us in the morning with the 3D printed acrylic shells, we actually make our denture shells manually and we are able to do the pickup and give the patient a pickup and give the patient a provisional immediately after surgery. This process takes about an hour. We make a brand new denture and we make a shell out of it once the implants are placed. And we just realign that denture in the power of the patient in a fusion and cement this permanently. Okay, as the provisional prosthesis. Same thing is done for the upper. We have a denture so the patient can have sort of an aesthetic triangle. So he already knows how his teeth are going to look. And we go ahead and we place the implants. We place these uh, caps. We use these caps because we don't want the acrylic to bond onto the implants directly. So we use the burnout caps as an intermediate. So the acrylic will go and hold on to the burnout cap instead. So another quick way to do it is make an entire shell so that it's completely free. You put a little bit of acrylic, just a little bit, don't load it completely, and put it in the patient's mouth, ask them to buy, wait five minutes, take it out, and it will pick up all the caps. And then extra orally, you can go and fill it up and give the patient a provision. Now, a provisional helps a lot. It goes a very long way in making a good final prosthesis, and that's why I'm showing you this case. The patient has this provisional in his mouth for six months. He has seen it, his family has seen it, everybody is happy with it. So that when we make the final prosthesis, all we have to do is replicate the provisional, and without any stress at all, we will achieve a beautiful result for yourself and the patient both. So six months later, the patient's come and we miss all the impression steps. Okay, we put always tissue silicone when pouring the models so that we can modulate the tissue. Not to pour the model only with plaster. You have to use a little bit of tissue silicone to modulate the tissue so that you can create a good emergence. Okay, spring them together, pour the model. And this step is what really makes all the difference. What we do is we take a provisional prosthesis from the patient's mouth, put it onto the cast and make a putty index, okay? So what the lab receives, the lab receives this index and what it means? That when he is working to make his wax pattern, when he is making, working to make his final prosthesis, he already knows the position of the central incisor. He knows exactly where it has to be because we have adapted this from the patient's provision. So this is a case done five years ago. Back then digital was not so prominent in India at least. But now we can do these steps with digital, but this is something that you can do very simply with every case. Even if you don't have any digital equipment, take the patient's provisional which he has approved, put it on the final task, make a putty index, and send this to the lab. So the lab can really make a beautiful 
casting for you. The casting gel will exactly support the ceramic, will have the right space for the gums, for the soft tissue, and will have a good hygiene design so the patient can clean the lower Okay? I'll go really very quick. So you see here the casting is made exactly with the correct amount of space for the ceramic. All this because we made a good provision and we gave that information to the lab with the use of this button mix. So we'll go quickly, the preparation guide, I will modify the abutment and we'll do the trial. Take a phase book. Anytime you're doing a full art restoration, you have to take a phase book. Okay, it makes a big difference in avoiding crucial contacts. He does the ceramic work, and if you see, even the tissue surface is covered in ceramic, and this helps a lot for the hygiene of the patient. It really helps a lot. Okay? And this is the case in the patient's mouth. And again, I was lucky enough, the patient came back to me uh, this month before I came here. So we can see the CBCT of this case six years post op in function with this particular bridge. And this is the scan that we took for him. And quickly I'll show you the section, these implants, basal implants, an extremely narrow bone has been integrated for more than six years and now in function. This is the other one, integrated, engaging the particles and now in function. This is a terrified implant, six years supporting this one, two, three unit cantilever, totally integrated in the terrified as you can see and in function. Okay? So these things work. They work as long as we follow the rules. Cases like this can be very easily treated, very simply treated if you just understand these three basic principles that I explained to you today. We have done about uh, 4,191 of these implants over the years and we have about a 96.5% success rate. Uh, so just want to show you that it's possible for you as well and you just have to follow all the rules. You miss even one rule and the whole thing comes down. Thank you very much for your patience. So, my dear friend, thank you very much for this nice, interesting lecture.